uh, all right, guys. Uh, we'd like to emphasize that SEDS and LOM make up a major part of the industry that we're all so uh, interested to join. And today with us, we have three great alumni who are here to share their experiences with us. Uh, ben Brockett, he is the CEO of Able Space Corporation. Uh, he was previously employed as a research and development engineer at Armadillo Aerospace, where he designed and tested rocket, propul rocket propulsion hardware. Uh, before that, he worked at Master, Aer Master Space Systems as a project manager. Um, ben received his BS from Iowa State University and served as vice chair of SEDS in 2006. Uh, we also have Matt Canella, who is a National Science Foundation uh, fellow and is a third year graduate student of Bushman Advanced Concepts Lab at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Go Bobs. <laughs> uh, he mainly researches chemical propulsion, having experience with solid, solid liquid, and hybrid rockets, uh, ro ho hybrid rocket engines, and propulsion concept development. Uh, Matt has also completed several internships with NASA and many aerospace firms in the private and new space sector. And last but not least, we have Frank Santella. Uh, he is a UB alum. He is a PhD candidate from the Department of Air Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences at MIT. Uh, uh, Frank Stantella with Brad Chetham were the co-founders of SEDS at the UB chapter, uh, where he graduated as, uh, when he was a graduate student with Professor Crescidas. After completing his MS from uh, the University of Buffalo, he worked at the Air Force Research Laboratory at, at Arizona State University on operations team on the Lunar Resonance Orbiter Camera where he, he is currently a graduate student of geophysics at MIT. Uh, his research mainly involves aircraft navigation, space orbit determination for the purpose of terrestrial and planetary gravity, gravity model. Uh, Frank devotes much of his time, spare time to space exploration outreach. outreach, outreach. So uh, help me welcome our three great alums. Just before Ben gets started, we wanted to, we have two late additions to the panel here. So we have uh, Rick Hanton in the back, uh, Reese's Daryl Kane of Award of Excellence winner uh, as of last night, <laughs> and Nathan Long, uh, currently of the X Prize Foundation. So Ben's gonna get off, get off. All right, uh, I can't see the slides at all, which is unfortunate, but. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm presenting on somewhat uh, an unusual topic. Like you said, I used to work for Mass and Space Systems and Armadillo Aerospace, and I'm starting up my own thing. But uh, uh, just show of hands, how many of you are in aerospace engineering or a, a related field? So most of the group. Um, the, oh, nice. The, so the. Uh, um, well, we're all here, like the previous panel was talking about working for New Space, you know, and I talked to have any previous years have talked about how to get jobs at New Space. Uh, the reality is that most of you will end up in what we call old space, just as a contrast, um, and in specific jobs in that area. So this is kind of talking about, you know, thinking about what you're going to end up doing. So, um, so. If you, if you look at these three companies, um, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, uh, you might think of them as space companies. Uh, Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Lockheed Martin has uh, both have uh, capsules. Uh, Northrop Grumman built the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. So you might be thinking of them as like possible space companies, uh, but in fact, what these companies are is the three of the four largest uh, defense contractors, aka weapons manufacturers in the world. Uh, Lockheed Martin. These are 2010 numbers. Uh, Lockheed Martin made 35 billion, and they both, you know, two and you know, two and four both had about 30 billion dollars in a single year's budget from the Department of Defense for, you know, basically building weapons. Um, so if you compare that to NASA, NASA made, you know, got in their budget 18.724 billion dollars in 2010 versus 35 billion, you know, almost twice as much. Uh, for building weapons. So, in reality, this is what most people in aerospace end up doing: is working on, you know, these kind of projects rather than working on space capsules or, you know, Mars missions or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, we think of we think of rockets. We usually, you know, think of this. I grew up as a space shuttle kid. I was born in 1981, so the space shuttle has been operating for most of my life, kind of thing. So, uh, it's always meant a lot to me. But in reality, this is what most rockets are that people are going to be working on. Um, 
this is from uh, the, the revolution in Libya. There's lots of, you know, this kind of thing out there. Uh, almost every space job of Iowa State Space Society, which I was involved in, um, I'm the only one who's in new space now. Uh, everyone else is either uh, working for, you know, other companies doing this kind of thing. So, um, so you know, defense, a lot of people are big fans of national defense. I, you know, it certainly has its place. Uh, but the, the other issue is that uh, we are not just building this stuff for us. The United States exports $8.461 billion of weapons every year, making us the number one arms exporter in the world. Uh, and the problem with that is that weapons last longer than relationships. Um, someone who is our ally today may not be our ally tomorrow, and someone who isn't our ally today, who we fund their opposition, may need to be our ally tomorrow. So sometimes our um, foresight into who we provide things to has not been great. So here's a short list of one country's uh, Air Force. The, the, the full list is vastly longer, but this is just a few selections. Uh, five different, com you know, different companies uh, building things from fighter jets, uh, attack helicopters, cargo transports, um, and you know there are hundreds and hundreds of these. So can anybody guess what country's Air Force this is? This is Iran. This is, you know, this is a small portion of the American jets owned by the country of Iran. Uh, and I'm not at all saying that we should go to war. I really hope we don't. But the way things have been going, um, it may end up that, I mean, just the other day we had a drone shot at, so it may end up that we have our own jets going up against our own jets, which is uh, a pretty shitty situation to be in. Um, so I'm, I'm not a pacifist, this is not me up here going like, you know, everything should be peace and everything. Force is sometimes an option, really. But, uh, you know, it's just important to keep in mind what you're doing. So, when you, uh, you know, dis at, once you guys have all graduated and decide to get jobs in the aerospace industry, I want you to keep in mind, like, what your actual objective is, um, you know, and decide, you know, well, I can do interesting space stuff um, and maybe make less, or I can do defense stuff and make more, but keep in mind that uh, it's not just you that your decision will affect. And you should also consider, you know, what your life's accomplishment will be. Will you be, at the end of your life when you're, you know, 75 years old and in the hospital and dying of whatever, are you going to, is your major claim going to be that you made it slightly more efficient to kill people, or are you going to be that you made it, you know, some science instrument that uh, actually improved the, our understanding of the universe. Um, so this is an incredibly long quote and totally violates, you know, like PowerPoint rules. But uh, uh, when a country decides to invest in arms rather than education, housing, the environment, and then my screen just passed out. But it basically says that, um, you know, there are better things we can do. Uh, None of this is regulated internationally. Like I said, we can sell stuff and then we don't actually uh, keep up with it and stuff lasts. Um, so this was the president of Costa Rica who got a Nobel Prize for um, reducing the number of wars in Central America. So this is just my final thought. This is the desert in Libya. Um, all of those green tubes in the foreground and stretching off into the background are rockets. Uh, imagine how stable your country would be if all it took for someone to try to overthrow your government would be to drive out into the desert and pick up some weapons. So, thank you. Um, thanks, Ben. And uh, next up, Nathan Wong is going to just, just give a little intro as to... Oh, one second. Okay, I can go then. We can pull up my slides. Yeah. Hopefully that works. Yeah. So, um, I guess just for clarification, um, we're all going to give little talks, and then we're going to have some Q&A here. Um, I'm actually trying to do the Ignite-style talk um, with lots of slides in not a lot of time, so we'll see if this works. Um, I'm going to be talking about using SEDS to lift off your career. Um, I've had a lot of experiences here. Um, you might wonder, who am I and why am I here? Um, I don't know, but I, what I can tell you is I'm an NSF research fellow at the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Um, and I am the director of operations for a great outreach program called We Want Our Future, which I'll tell you about. Um, I guess I'm here because I have a lot of college experience um, interning at space companies, both in the new space and old space realms. Um, I worked for Masson Space Systems uh, for a spring in 2010, um, and I've interned at Kennedy Space Center and Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, SEDS has always been a really great experience for me, uh, and something I've really been involved with, um, from helping to start uh, UB SEDS Rocketry, which I'll talk a little bit about, 
um, all the way to my current role as a graduate advisor at CU Sens um, in Colorado. Um, so UB Rocketry, the award-winning club, now I can say that, um, started with that rocket on the left called the Pretty Pretty Princess Rocket <laughs> that I built at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and it's really grown to this uh, excellent community of, of students um, learning how to build rockets and learning how to, to gain their certifications. Um, we also incorporated one of the first uh, SEDS USA launch sites on an onion farm in Elba, New York. Um, onion rockets are a really good time if you want to you know, look into that. Um, oh, I cannot see the screen. Um, but also, uh, SEDS can provide a great support network, and this rocketry thing was one example of that. If you have a crazy project idea, SEDS can help give you some legitimacy towards that. It can give you support, and it, uh, most importantly, it can give you some friendships. With that, friendships and with the, with the support network, you can really use SEDS as a launch pad. You can help determine what your why is, and then you can really explore that why and your passion. Um, so it's really great opportunity to do that, especially when you're young. Um, so I guess the, the best thing that I can do is just kind of talk about my trajectory and how SEDS has really helped me um, form my two passions, which are propulsion and rocketry um, and traveling. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll go through and kind of hopefully tell you how SEDS has worked. Hopefully this video works, I'm not sure if it is. Um, I graduated from the Pretty Pretty Princess rocket program days uh, into the NASA Propulsion Academy, um, which I found out through fellow SEDS member Frank, um, and was able to work on a liquid oxygen, liquid methane rocket. Um, since coming to CU, I've done a lot of work with hybrid rockets, um, including this small rocket uh, engine right here that you see, which we bring to uh, middle schools and high schools and get kids excited about rocketry, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit too. Uh, my max Q, my, my highest stress moment came uh, a couple years ago when we were testing a large hybrid rocket engine in a missile silo in Wyoming. Um, and about halfway through the burn, uh, the combustion chamber breached, which was not a good day. Um, it actually sawed itself in half, so that was not good. But I recovered from that. I learned probably more from the failure than I, I uh, learned from successes. Um, and currently I'm working on a um, Spaceship 2 flight uh, experiment that Will has alluded to several times throughout the conference. Um, I really like to travel, um, uh, and uh, I've tried to use SEDS and my space experiences uh, to help me get some free travel, um, and it's been really, really good to be able to do that. Um, so here is a picture from Canada just a couple of days ago. The other one was from uh, a past space vision. Um, you can use organizations like the Space Generation Advisory Council, which has been mentioned um, this year in Space Vision, but hasn't been mentioned in the past. Uh, great friendship between the two organizations. Conferences like the International Astronomical Congress, um, and even your friendships in SEDS. It was through SEDS member Bruce Davis that I was able to find out about this awesome opportunity in China and got to take that SEDS shirt to the Great Wall, so that was a really cool experience for me. Um, so by using your support network and using your friends, you can really find out some great opportunities. But I think it's most important to actually give back. I mean, you're going to do some really cool things in your life, but if you leave and no one knows where to pick up the baton and how to keep going, then I think you failed, really. Um, and you can really use the projects that you're working on today for good. If you're building a high-altitude balloon, go to a middle school, have the kids design something really small, give them volume, weight constraints, and say, we'll put this in our balloon payload, something like that. Um, these two projects are both from hybrid rocket projects I've done. And we've gone to schools and really, uh, really inspired kids. I also talked about we want our future before. We have an interactive postcard activity. We've collected postcards from about 35 states, countries around the world, um, middle schoolers, hopefully we get them excited. So the challenge to you in the end is to become more involved in SEDS. Don't discourage or discount the power of SEDS friendships. You can really learn a lot. Uh, and you're only in college for a little bit of time, so use that time wisely. Do internships, be at, you know, be involved in outreach, and don't forget the Superman cats that uh, Nate talked about yesterday. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and Nate Wong's gonna come up now. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I got roped into this last night at like 3:30 in the morning, uh, and I just made my presentation here at the table. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, so, like Matt, Indian night style, all my slides will auto advance. Uh, and in true night style, they'll have nothing to do with the talk that I'm going to give you today. Uh, they're all images from the Google Lunar X Prize that we're just sort of showing you for the first time today. They've never been shown in public. Uh, but what I want to talk about is how I got started in SEDS. Uh, it started just like uh, it started at the Marshall Space Flight Center where I met Matt Canella. Uh, and we were all sitting around a room talking on the first day that we met, talking until about 2 in the morning. Uh, and 
you want to know how to get more involved. And that's like, well, there's this super crazy organization called SEDS, and uh, just like they said yesterday, they're trying to take over the world. And I truly believe that the SEDS members will be able to do that. Um, so I was like, I need to know, I need to know a little bit more about this. So I went to my first space vision in 2009 in Arizona, where I met more crazy space people, uh, including Ben, including Rick, uh, and uh, including Ryan, and much, a bunch of other people I see out in the audience. And these are the same people I see going to professional conferences, going to student conferences. And it's really a bond that you create within the SEDS community. I went back to my university and knew for a fact that I needed to start a SEDS chapter. Uh, we had an AIAA chapter, but our AIAA chapter focused mainly on space. And I wanted to use SEDS as a platform to bring in more opportunities for students to work on hardware, work on real life projects that would get them involved. Uh, so with that, I started the XHAB project, which was a project to uh, design and build an inflatable habitat for the NASA Johnson Space Center. We did that with about 11 students and won that competition when no one thought we could win because Wisconsin doesn't even have an aerospace program. Uh, I then decided that engineering wasn't for me uh, and went to the International Space University where I started, tried to diversify. Uh, and I learned about ISU from Space Vision. Uh, I went there and did a little bit about business, policy, and law. Uh, and now I'm working at the XPRIZE Foundation. So I've really gone from the Peter D. Mandis, Toby Hawley, uh, Bob Richards, Seth, to the Peter D. Mandis, Toby Hawley, uh, Bob Richards, ISU, to the now Peter D. Mandis, XPRIZE. <laughs> Uh, so next time you will see me from Planetary Resources <laughs> and or Zero G and or something else. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to close with, make sure you keep up the friends that you've, that you've met here today. Make sure you keep up with the professional contacts that you've met here today. Because uh, those are the people that are going to help you in your future. Uh, and I know that they've helped me. So, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, can we pull up Rick Hanton's slides? I know the wizard, yeah, the wizard behind the curtain. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Pretty logo, huh? Pretty cool logo. <laughs> Sounds like we've got it under control. Sweet. So, let's see. I'm going to fix this problem. Hold on. Okay. So, I am trying to do a night talk, except for I forgot to do the slide advances. So, we'll just take it from here and see how it goes. So, I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, one path, or kind of my path, really, towards getting a job. Um, maybe it'll work for you. I know some people take other paths, like getting super awesome GPAs. Not my path. <laughs> uh, so, anyhow, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm also from Iowa State. I also was part of the Iowa State Space Society. Um, that was, it was basically Ben and our friend Karina who got me started. Um, and I was definitely not a space geek before I started on SEDS and uh, all this stuff. Yeah, so thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so SEDS, uh, I'm originally from Minnesota, so go Minnesota. I know there's a couple people here. Um, we, we're we kind of weird because there's really no space anything in Minnesota. Um, and then most recently, I've been working for Lockheed Martin, so yeah, the big bad, bad guys. Um, but yeah, I don't know, hopefully the things I do are, are good, and I can't tell you that much about them, but you know, <laughs> which is fun. Um, so anyhow, uh, the big question is, how can you stand out in PAC for your dream job? How can you get that dream job that you really, really want? And um, especially when there's so many other students out there vying for a job at SpaceX or a job at uh, planetary resources where, you know, they said they had, they've given out so few jobs since they started. Um, I know a few guys that started just before they announced, so lucky them. Um, college is an amazing place. Let me just tell you this. I am 
So basically, the, the trick to this talk is I am a club junkie. Uh, basically, I, I love organizations. They're awesome. Uh, there are so many organizations at colleges. Like, there's SEDS, but there's also you know, all kinds of different things. I basically just search Google and, you know, there's photography clubs, there's like uh, construction engineering clubs, like, you know, the construction engineer do it. Uh, there's government club, you know, government groups, whatever. And then, of course, like I've got at the bottom, there's all these different opportunities you can do where you can go around the world and just do really, really amazing things and go learn in China or something like that, which is really cool. So, GPA is important, but GPA is definitely not everything. Um, my GPA was uh, basically got lower. I, I started out doing aerospace, and my GPA started reasonably okay, uh, and then kind of went lower and lower and lower and lower. Uh, and then I switched majors, and uh, everything was good again. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, GPA is not everything. Um, I got my first job during school when my GPA was the lowest of all of my school time. Um, and basically because I found a manager who just understood that I was doing all this other cool stuff. And uh, you know, school was important to me, but not as important as other things. So as long as you keep, the, keep your GPA at a reasonable level and do really, really cool stuff on the side, that can get you some really cool opportunities. So some of the things that I did in school, um, uh, big thank you to the person who uh, I interviewed with when I first was trying to get into MIT back in high school um, because she turned me on to, she said, oh, you like Legos, you like engineering. There's this thing called First Lego League. Um, and so this was like the first thing I joined when I was in college. Um, it's really, really awesome. If you're, your state probably has this and you should go and you should volunteer um, because it's super easy. You can volunteer for like a day, a day or you can volunteer for months and work with teams. But it's really cool. Um, they have a lot of fun. We have a gigantic event in Iowa. Um, so uh, anyhow, check it out. Uh, other things, uh, the Iowa State Space Society. Um, I got to go to all kinds of cool rocket launches. Um, this is one of the better ones. It was like, that was a 15-foot scale replica of a Saturn V that a guy built in his garage over the winter. Um, so really, really awesome. Uh, I still, I'm not sure I found the video of the rocket that was that big that came off the pad and started uh, heading towards uh, Jason and I. Um, that was interesting too. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's a lot of fun. Also, uh, student government, like, if you, I know you all are space geeks and aerospace people and whatever, but student government's cool too because that gives you that, you know, government political experience. You at least have some inkling of what those crazy people do. Um, so. I was a cool government official and I was an appointee, which is where it's at, uh, instead of getting elected. Uh, but yeah, I worked for this guy over on the side, Dan. Uh, also, Iowa State Daily. Uh, I worked for the college newspaper for a while, and if you want to get your ideas out there, uh, just put them directly in the paper. It's the way to go. Um, yeah, because people always say, you know, hey, the news isn't talking about space, the news isn't, you know. I don't see what I want to see in the news, so I just put what I wanted to see in the newspaper. Um, and then, of course, got all kinds of chat from the, uh, I don't know, the, you know, groups on campus for my crazy biases for space and engineering and uh, liberal stuff. Uh, and then, of course, SEDS. Um, yeah, I, I got involved in the United States Space Society, and then SEDS kind of roped me in. Um, thank you to. Uh, Joshua Nelson, if you see him around, and oh yeah, and back, the guy standing up, and uh, <laughs> my predecessor, uh, and also to uh, Daryl Payne. So, yeah, um, I, and then it, here's where I ran out of like actual slide making abilities. So, <laughs> so one more thing that is really awesome in my experience was traveling. Um, there's a lot of really cool opportunities in school where you can travel and you can like. Um, I didn't. I didn't do this, but. I know at my school there's opportunities to basically pay tuition for me in Iowa and then go actually, you know, go off and live in Germany or something like that. And that is really cool. And that, you know, definitely makes employers look at your your application and say, wow, this is pretty pretty interesting. Look what this kid did. So for all you younger younger people out there, um, this is, you know, all of these different opportunities is the way to go. It's the way to get a job. Um, it's what got me my jobs. Um, but, and I hope that I can help you too. So, thank you.
picking up the pack. Hi everyone. Um, so as you heard, uh, my name is Frank, and uh, about five years ago, um, many of us in the room got together and started uh, SEDS at the University of Buffalo. Um, with this talk, I kind of wanted to discuss my personal motivations for helping to start it, uh, what our goals were at that time, and uh, what our new goals nationally should be for the next year or so. Um, the simplest reason I can give for why I wanted to start um, the SEDGE chapter at UB was that I was out looking for a fight. Um, see, I'm gay, and this is an important note about my history because even before I knew this about myself, I knew I wanted to be a military pilot and someday apply to the astronaut corps. Soon after high school, I went to the Air Force Academy, um, and the military at that time had in place one of the most discriminatory policies in our nation's history, which discharged um, over 10,000 taxpayer-trained people um, from the military based on their sexuality. I could not reconcile the person that I am with the Academy's Honor Code, which states that we will not lie, cheat, steal, nor tolerate among us anyone who will. I agree with that Honor Code. So I couldn't come to terms with lying to my colleagues, my closest friends, for the job I knew I would love, so I left. In the subsequent decade, I traveled the world and soul-searched for a way to express my love of exploration. I moved ten times in ten years. I lived here in Buffalo, in San Bernardino, California, Rome, Italy, Darmstadt, Germany, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Kihei, Maui, Hawaii, and uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And I even slept on an air mattress uh, on my friend's dining room floor in Boston for a few months. Um, I spent time in uh, graduate school, worked on spaceflight instrument operations for NASA and the Air Force Research Lab, but I still always wanted to fly. And for me, SEDS is my outlet for what I could not or was not allowed to express as an officer and pilot in our nation's military. You might ask why I've traveled so much and stressed up so much about um, you know, discovering truly who I am and what my purpose on the planet is. Um, I think the answer to that question is something that everyone in this room deals with. Uh, the reason for this struggle is because there's no way to go to school and get a job in the field we want because what we truly want doesn't exist yet. There's no easy solution to get us from where we are now in this room to where we want to be in the future, which is colonizing space, hiking the volcanoes of Mars, or sailing on the methane seas of Titan. I think that every SEDS member in the country knows that uh, we need to create that future. When we started SEDS at UB, my initial motivation was to help UB students find a path from their undergraduate work to career opportunities in exploration. And uh, I am overwhelmed at the success uh, UB SEDS has had, and I'm really excited for what they've accomplished and, and what's ahead. Um, and to discuss what is in fact ahead of us, I reflect on our mission uh, as SEDS. We need to ask why we are really here and what we are really doing with our time, especially at these conferences. Our national website says that SEDS believes in a space-faring civilization and that focusing the enthusiasm of young people is the key to our future in space. And I have to say that we as SEDS members seem to be doing great. We do great research, we get great jobs, we attract investors, we start new exploration companies, and we have fun careers. We in this room have decided to be explorers, but why? And to answer this, uh, I need to quote Gene Roddenberry, who said, discussing his creation, Star Trek, the purpose of all this? To show humans as we really are. We are capable of extraordinary things, and I am stunned and thrilled by events such as the falling of the Berlin Wall and the spectacular spread of democracy in Europe, incidents such as uh, humanitarian gestures for AIDS victims, the magnificent achievements of the Voyager spacecraft team, efforts toward hunger relief, and the rapprochement with those we saw as forever bitter enemies, referring to the Soviet Union at that time. He had a global perspective when he created Star Trek, um, and we need that perspective because even though we in this room have decided to become explorers, the decision must eventually made, be made by our entire species. We need to build consensus on Earth to agree on the value of exploration. That will teach humans the necessity of exploration and earn the spiritual support and eventually the funding to become a truly cosmic species. So every SEDS member has a duty to do outreach and evangelize human space exploration. And the definition of evangelize is to preach and win converts for your spiritual mission. 
This means that our goal is to cause global societal change. If this is not our goal, we risk uh, being mere space enthusiasts, and this might as well be a science fiction convention, we might as well be dressed up as Wookiees and Vulcans. A few times a year, every SEDS member should find a school or museum to speak in. And don't just discuss your companies or your research, you need to literally engage your audience. If they don't ask questions, then you start asking them questions. Ask, what do you think? Is my research valuable? Do you think this is a waste of money? Don't you think we could be spending our energy doing more important things? These types of questions, though you might not always like the answers, will inspire a debate in that room. Um, and use the opportunity to learn about the true opinions of the general public about space exploration and to educate where possible. Don't worry about the outcome, just let it happen. We need to pass the torch and be mentors to grade schools and high schools and the general public. We owe it to our cause and to all of the mentors from NASA who have showed up this week um, and the new space movement and, and all of the leaders from so many organizations who have take, taken time out this weekend to mentor us. Um, the Buddha observed that thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle. And this weekend I got to hang out with hundreds of candles so we can ignite many more. Also in the next year, SEDS has to organize a congressional hearing. We need to educate our leaders because they are not as smart about space exploration as they should be. We need to teach them that the, there is a connection between spaceful, successful space exploration and the economy, between green technology and human space habitats. We need to show them that space exploration is a facilitator of international stability, cooperation, and basic human rights because it enhances the human perception of our species, Earth, and the universe. Basically, we need to teach our government that space exploration will positively affect every other aspect of civilization. In these ways, we will ignite the argument that hopefully causes humans to become a truly sustainable species. And this means that says it's not just a student club or a professional network. It is the first step in the greatest revolution Earth has ever seen. Thank you. time for questions here because we really wanted to make sure that we could have a discussion with the current students of SEDS. And we have a lot of experience up in this room, it's very diverse, so feel free to ask us any questions. Questions don't have to be at all related to anything we talked about. Yeah, they can be anything. They don't have to be related to what we talked about or, or anything like that. Yeah, whatever. They don't need to be space questions. <laughs> Anyone? Ooh. Ooh. Be bold. Sorry, I have some questions. Go for it. Uh, how many um, ex-SEDs or other like working folks do we still have in the room? Can you raise your hands? All right, so a few. Um, have your like your previous chapters, your local chapters, ever talked to you uh, about uh, like funding any of their projects? This is one thing that I that I keep, keeps coming to mind for me is that um, you know all of you chapters uh, are a lot of you are doing really interesting projects. Um, and uh, for a lot of them, it's on the order of a few hundred dollars to do something interesting like launch a rocket or, or put together a suitcase rocket or do any of that sort of thing. So you guys, um, a lot of people work through their student government to get funding from their college or whatever, but uh, you guys, one thing that chapters could be a lot better at would be actually following up with your alumni and going like, hey, you know, we, we want to build a rocket, could you chip in $250? And you will find out that it is much easier than you think it is to get money from your alumni. Uh, because, you know, we all really enjoyed our times in our SEDS chapters and uh, we are happy to help our, you know, our old groups or even other groups that happen to be nearby uh, to, to continue doing awesome stuff. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've been to two space stations, absolutely loved it, met some really cool people um, and participated in, a, in the COC and all that. And there's really no interaction, I mean, at least on our level, like between chapters besides space vision. Um, you know, I mean, we, we talk and we do this and that, but we don't really do much. Um, what do you think could fix that? That, uh, for me, there's always been kind of a debate about the role of national uh, SEDs uh, versus the individual chapters. And for me, that I consider that the singular goal of national SEDs is to coordinate communications between the groups to make sure that all the groups know what all the other groups are doing. So if you don't think that... Um, 
that you that you know what every other chapter in SEDS is doing, then I consider that a failure of national SEDS, and you should probably become the, the chair and make it actually happen. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we tell each other what we're doing, but it's not like a, an interactive thing. Right. It's like a list of, we did this in the last month. Yeah, and, uh, the, the other thing is that um, uh, there have been, in the history of SEDS, actually quite a few regional conferences as well. So it doesn't have to be just coming to the national one. You can say there was one a few years ago in the Northeast, basically, like all of the Northeast chapters came up. Here yeah. uh, Iowa State Space Society, actually, before it was a SEDS chapter, ran Midwestern space conferences for three years. So And we had one last year. We had around 200 people come and only one other SEDS member for another chapter. I mean, so we're in North Carolina. There aren't many really close by. But like, what do you think we could <coughs> Start new said chapters. Uh, but I think really the foundation of, of interaction with other said chapters starts with the friendships that you gain here at Space Vision. So by cultivating those friendships, um, you really can more have a mutual interest to go visit them, even if it's not for space, just to go hang out and have a good time for a weekend. These are the things that start random ideas. Like Nate said, we were talking at 2 in the morning, and he said, what is this crazy thing called SEDS? And it just kind of started from there. It's it's experiences like that that really can change the dynamic of your SEDS group in your school. That's my opinion. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to add? I mean, it is the age of like social media and blogs and everything. So really, every group should be publicizing themselves what they're doing with a, their own you know blog. Uh, there's a there was I don't know if there still is a SEDS national wiki. Um, when, I, when I was in Space Society, I always put all of our meeting notes up there, so at least there would be a record that people could find to find out what we we're talking about on a weekly basis. So just making everything you're doing available, like it's not like any group is doing much stuff in secret, so uh, you can just make everything available. Like the, the default should always be to be too open about everything that you're doing. So. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Station time. Does yeah. anybody know if uh, Space Up Boston is going to happen? Space Up Boston. I went to the first Space Up in San Diego, but uh, I don't know about many of the subsequent ones. Sorry. Is anybody here from Boston or Boston area? All right. You guys have to run a Space Up there. So. <laughs> Tomorrow. Uh, <no. laughs> the Space Up is, a, is an unconference where it's like everything is just figured out on the day as to what it's It's a really interesting approach. It's very inexpensive to run uh, and very inexpensive to attend. And I went to the first Space Up in San Diego, uh, which was started by Chris Radcliffe and a bunch of friends. At the, uh, they have, the setup in San Diego is amazing. They have the Space Emporium. They actually have uh, a street front property where they sell space-related stuff and where they have their space meetings. And people can wander in off of the street and buy like space souvenirs or buy a trip on a suborbital rocket. So <laughs> it is one of the most impressive setups I've ever seen in the, there. And you know, every city could have one of those if they wanted to. It just says uh, floral, uh, floral, so kind of right. out of floral. <laughs> running out of fall. Are you guys at Chapel Hill having a Yuri's night? That's the Lord, or anything? Started playing yesterday. Awesome. Yeah, because I mean that could that could be your regional thing that you invite other you know other schools, AIAA club, whatever you know, come down the road. Um, everybody in the room should be having a, a shot of vodka on Yuri's night. <laughs> oh yeah. So Yuri's night is um, the, the global space party that celebrates uh, humanity becoming a spacefaring civilization. So Yuri Gagarin flew uh, on April 12, 1961, um, and since then. Um, Kind of said's progeny have uh, you know Loretta had Delta Whiteside started this uh, global space party, um, and uh, in over 200 countries uh, all over the world, um, you know people are celebrating human spaceflight um, on the same day. So that's what that is. There are pictures from the International Space Station of people wearing Yuri's Night T-shirts on April 12th. Like it is literally, you know, it, is, it has been to Antarctica. It has been on the International Space Station. So it is the World Space Party. And weirdly, it, it actually isn't celebrated very much in Russia because they have their own uh, thing already. But, uh, <laughs> well, that's space day. Yeah. Yeah. Cosmonauts Day. Yeah. Um, let's just see a show of hands. How many of you have gone into a museum or a school? within the last calendar year and talked about space. All right, it's better than I thought, <laughs> but it still can be improved upon. Um, there's a lot of opportunities within SEDS to make things like this happen, to really get out there and inspire the next generation. I have a question for the panel. OK. Uh, so Space Vision for me was my first conference. I was talking to a couple people yesterday where it was their first conference as well. What, conf what other conferences would you suggest for SEDS people to go to? 
I would suggest Space Generation Congress. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, you know, I, I worked at NASA one summer and I found out about SpaceX or, or Space uh, Generation Congress, and it happened to be in Valencia, Spain that year. And um, you know, it was the first one, first con conference I went to where I met uh, people my age that were talking about space as if it was something that was relevant globally. Um, the Space Generation Congress has observer status on the United Nations uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Um, and, and it was a place where delegates actually uh, argued and uh, got to draft resolutions about um, what the world's youth wanted to see in terms of uh, the, the use of space. Um, and so right after that, I found out about SEDS, and uh, you know, in the next chapter, um, we were starting a SEDS chapter at UB. So um, that's the one I like. Um, sort of like the, the SEDS conference of small space companies, it's called Space Access. Uh, it, it's every year in Phoenix, um, and it's unfortunately in early April, so it often conflicts with Yuri's night, but there's a, usually a party there. Um, it, it's basically all of the small companies, like the ones that I've worked for, come and talk about what they're working on. And then there are also other people who are just in the very beginnings, like uh, the folks who are doing laser launch and all kinds of alternative launch schemes will come and talk. Uh, it's, it's about three days long, so it's pretty similar to SEDS. It's run single track, so you can actually go to every single, every single talk. And uh, actually, this year he ran it like 13 hours a day. So it was, uh, it was, you know, a, a fire hose of information from all of these companies. So it's it's really interesting if you're curious about all the small companies. Um, uh, then it's really interesting. Actually, Gwyn Shotwell from SpaceX was there a couple of years ago. So it's not just the smallest ones. Uh, this last year, one of the more neat ones was where they were working on the Centaur rocket. So there is some representation. The other, of course, the big space conference is ISDC, National Space Society's convention. Um, which is a good look into the entire field. Um, and you'll, you'll find out about all kinds of other stuff there, too. So. Just, just to give another plug for space access, it's also one of the only conferences I've been to where wearing shorts is completely okay, uh, which is a really relaxing feel to a conference, and I think really inspires uh, more just kind of casual discussion, uh, which, in my opinion, builds better friendships. Uh, I'll add one more. Uh, I'm kind of biased, as many people here are, but... Uh, uh, I, I really like the uh, New Space Conference out in California. That's a good one too. Um, where uh, some of my favorite things are having, like, they tend to have a extreme ability to get all the NASA, or a lot of the NASA center directors in on stage at once, so that's kind of fun. And, uh, yeah, investors show up, uh, SpaceX people, like the, the top SpaceX people who hire you show up and talk to you. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty cool if you can get out there. That's always been my problem. And, and it's just one more addition um, to kind of tag on to Frank's thing. The Space Generation Congress almost always uh, lines up with the International Astronautical Congress. Um, and it's a conference that rotates around the world every year. Um, as Frank mentioned, the ties to the UN make it a really big uh, Congress um, where literally you'll have a panel with the, he the head of NASA, the head of JAXA, the head of the Chinese Space Agency, the head of ESA, like all sitting on the stage at the same time. Um, it's sometimes really hard to get to because it is international and it rotates around. I think next year it's in Beijing, China, so that might be difficult. But the year after, it's in Toronto, which if you came to Buffalo, Toronto's just a couple hours up the road. So uh, really something to look forward to. I think it's 2015 there, so um, something to look forward to. Um, I'm Rebecca Zagorski <coughs> from Ember Riddle. We do not have a SEDS chapter. We have a student organization that, in my opinion, should be a SEDS chapter. Um, which, which Ember Riddle? Uh, Daytona Beach. The Daytona Beach campus. You had a SEDS chapter. <laughs> I've, I've been told many times. Um, but what suggestions do you all have for me to try and get a SEDS chapter started again? Uh, so the way I did it, uh, is that I became president of the chapter, and I sort of hostily took it over <laughs> in a way in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, but it's really a, a joint effort, and if there's similar, similarities between the two uh, programs, you can really have them work together. Right. I know a couple other sense chapters around the country also partnered with other organizations. It doesn't need to be a one-off thing. Uh, and sometimes when you split them up, you tend to divide the people instead of uniting the people. I just wanted to say also that this is, the New Space Conference was my first conference, and this is my second conference that I've been to, and as a SEDS organization that I'm not a part of, you guys have made me feel so welcome, and I appreciate it. It, uh, it reminds me of sort of the Greek world, where 
uh, the fraternity and sorority life is very open to those that aren't part of the world. So thank you very much. Yeah. My alternative speech was actually going to be like, says it's a fraternity and you can take advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you all here, like, if you ever decide to travel across the country, you can just like call up the local says chapter and be like, hey, we're, we're the says chapter from here. Can we crash on your couch? And it will totally work. So um, I was talking. Nathan, to, Nathan just did that as he drove across. I went to LA and I like, called up Rick about one day earlier. I was like, Rick, need a place to stay. He's like, oh. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I was talking to Jeff Faust last night, and he was telling me about how they met. Uh, he, he was going to Caltech, and they met Arizona says chapter because uh, Caltech put on a, a speech with uh, uh, Carl Sagan and Dan Golden, uh, the administrator of NASA around then, and uh, uh, the Arizona people just showed up and said, "Hey, we're the Arizona says chapter." And he was like, oh, I didn't know there was an Arizona says chapter. And they were like, there is now. <laughs> so, really, I, I came from Iowa State Space Society, which actually started out as an L5 chapter and then an NSS chapter, and then it was just a student space thing. We actually predated SEDS. And the only difference between before we were in SEDS and after we were in SEDS was just that we said, okay, we're a SEDS chapter now. I mean, it's, it's $25 or whatever the, you know, the registration is to be, to be a chapter. And it, we continued on being the same space society that we were. Um, so, I mean, you know, you, you don't have to have a separate SEDS thing. It could be the AIAA chapter could be the SEDS chapter as well, or just your, whatever, the rocket team could be the SEDS chapter, or the, the CubeSat team could be a SEDS chapter. Um, you could even have, I don't know if there are any colleges to do, but you could even have more than one SEDS chapter at the same school, which would be pretty fun. But, uh, yeah, so there's no, there's no magic to, you know, starting a SEDS chapter. It's like if you have a group of people who are interested in space. Every SEDS chapter in the U.S. is three or five, dedicated people who really are interested in this stuff and then everyone else that they drag into it just by being motivated so i mean that's all it takes yeah free pizza is a, a powerful thing <laughs> and, and just to expand upon that a little bit uh, as nate was saying as you know his chapter was an aaa chapter he also joined a sets uh, made a set chapter out of it as well and it really expanded the opportunities they had between things like the rocketry competition the balloon comp uh, what was the balloon rocket one on a balloon or raccoon? Yeah, they had a competition back then. Even the things like the Christmas office decoration contest. It's just a lot of new opportunities and a lot of, a whole new network that your group can tap into. Hey, I'll just shout. I'm Zach from uh, University of Buffalo. Um, I have a couple of pieces of advice. I, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, I want to start a, set, a SEDS chapter. Um, start now. Um, get get the contact information of the business card of someone who is running this conference or you know a, a SEDS alum and they will put you in contact with the right people we'll all be happy to help the the point is you need to start now I, I I've started not a SEDS chapter but clubs before and um, that's the biggest advice you can get um, the second biggest is um, to force people to come to your meetings if you don't force people to come to your meetings then no one is going to get interested and uh, just as a point of note, uh, Zach Pace is one of the organizers of the conference, so feel free to talk to him. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I remember being super motivated after Space Missions when I was a student, so now is definitely the time. Like, we, uh, Iowa State Space Society, we got an email from this guy named Kurt Cattell at UIUC, and he was like, hey, we're putting on this space conference, you guys should come out. And we were in Iowa at the time, so it's a pretty easy drive. So, like, five of us piled into a car and drove over there for this conference. And on the way back, we were like, that was awesome, we're a SEDS chapter now. So, you know, that, that's really all it takes. Time for one more question, if there's any. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's my experience that the general public is not going to generally come ask for um, presentations about space exploration. Um, and that's the most unfortunate thing. Uh, what I've done about 50% of the time uh, is just seek out opportunities to go talk about my work. Um, you know, all you know, teachers I know, I'd say, oh, like I, one thing I really love to do is get people excited about space. Um, I'll come to your classroom, I'll bring model spacecraft and 20-foot pictures of the moon, you know. You, you can print out some really, like, great stuff that NASA's done over the past few years. Um, and just uh, bring it to them, right? 
the other 50% of the time, you, you do that after a while and people start to invite you to things. So I think you need to start doing that first, you know. Go to a museum, say, I want to be one of your, you know, weekend, your temporary exhibits, you know, programming. I don't know if you guys have props that you built or airplanes or rockets or anything like that. Um, but start doing that. They'll start inviting you to come back. The better you get at it, they'll start inviting you to come back. So. The, the, the other thing, too, is that people are generally, even though they might not be like, oh, I want to build this awesome, regeneratively cooled nozzle that has optimized cooling channels, people are generally excited about space flight. So if you show them a picture of like the space shuttle launching, they're going to be like, ooh. And it's that ooh that you have to, to drag in and kind of capitalize on to really get them excited. So integrating what you do as SEDS into non, like completely other events at your school. I know you at UNC don't have an aerospace program, but you guys have a lot of other majors. So your projects are probably extremely different than the rest of the projects in this room. But that doesn't make them any less or more able to capitalize and, and get, it, get people excited about space. So I think uh, integrating your projects into normal university life, into just, you know, if there's like a club fair, then go show off awesome stuff you guys have done, just stuff like that. Yeah, quick, in, your, in my experience, it, I, I've kind of, I, I search sets all the time, so I kind of see you guys pop up and so on. But you guys are probably like one of the better chapters out there in terms of actually getting information out to the, like, <laughs> You know, to the news, to the public, to the other people at the university. You know, all the rest of these chapters, they're a bunch of aerospace majors, and they don't really know what the hell they're doing with, like, <laughs> you know, outreaching to the public, outreaching to the newspapers, all that stuff. So they should learn, but, you know, you guys really can teach them, because you guys, you know, you're a whole bunch of different majors, right? You guys have the skills. And unfortunately, I think we're, we're out of time. Um, Mary has some, some stuff, okay. Oh, oh, one quick question. sent to your school, stuff like that is, is really easy, but unfortunately a lot of teachers don't know that it exists. Um, that's number one. And number two, I had a high school calculus teacher who completely blew my mind about what uh, what space could be, and that's really what changed my uh, personal perspective. Yeah, I was actually exactly the same way. I had a high school calculus teacher who, <laughs> who, who had uh, applied for the Teachers in Space program, uh, knowing he wouldn't make it because they were looking for a woman. <laughs> uh, due, to, due to insider connections, but yeah, same thing. Um, I can't count the number of teachers that have helped inspire me. So, um, you know, right from a uh, shoot third grade on, uh, right up until I graduated high school. So, okay. So Mary is up here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you don't know by now, there's an addendum to the addendum. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so pretty much in about 10 minutes, uh, we will have a group photo, so if you guys could go and grab everybody you know, grab your wife, your kids, and come back here, and uh, about 10 minutes, what time is it right now? 11 and 4, so about 11.15, we'll have a group photo, again, we want it as big as possible. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have the election results for you guys, and then the closing remarks by, I guess, our forum, yeah, what's it, what's it? Oh, 106. Pictures and words. Which is here, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Photo is in here. Um, yes, and then after that, we'll have election results for you guys and closing remarks, and we'll send you on your way. I just want to say that we are giving mics to these amazing uh, sets alone, and I'm just saying, if you guys stay in sets and come back here.